to the Wildline Podcast. I'm your host, Dan. This is a podcast about movies and how much money they make at the box office. Uh, so this weekend was the weekend, folks. This was the It weekend. Uh, the one I've been talking about probably for about two months. Um, ever since summer sort of petered out there at the end of July and that very barren August... Uh, I've been looking forward to this weekend, and I think a lot of box office nerds have been looking forward to seeing how well it could do. Everybody knew uh, who was following the film and just following the box office in general, everybody knew that it was going to do well. Now, we weren't crazy. Uh, We knew that it was a rated R horror film, but it was pretty easy to tell that there was a large amount of hype going on with it. Um, as to why it was so hyped, I mean, I'll get into that later. Um, but sometimes you can just feel it in the air almost. Um, maybe on the web, uh, you can feel it. Uh, it's just the way people were talking about it, the type of people that were talking about it. It wasn't just sort of the arty horror nerds that were talking about it who sort of, uh, you know, the type of people who would go see It Follow as opening weekend or were like watching to see when it would come to their town or the type of person that would see The Witch opening weekend. It wasn't just those people, which is my set of people. Uh, it was everybody. Everybody I knew was talking about It. Oh, did you see the trailer? Oh, man, it looks crazy. Can't wait to see it. So it had this large amount of hype going into the weekend, which is why I had thought that, you know, Maybe three months ago, I would have said $40, $50 million opening weekend. This is going to be massive. It's going to be huge. Just keep it in mind that we're talking about September, right? This is September. This is the doldrums. September along with January and I believe February, those are the the worst three months in the box office. Usually it's January and September are sort of like kind of neck and neck. Uh, January usually being the worst, September usually coming in second or third uh, worst for the year. It's not a very lucrative, rich box office month. Um, People are going back to school. um, Jobs are starting up again. People are coming back from vacation in August. It's just, it's always been quiet. And that had been the case this year, as I've talked about at length on this podcast, during the later part of the summer, the box office essentially crashed, right? Like it was off um, from the period of June 23rd to the end of the summer. It was off about over $700 million from last year, which is a lot of money. That's like 6% of the total annual box office. It was a crash. The box office crashed. And there's no new movie released last weekend, a f- you know, holiday weekend, a four day weekend, Labor Day weekend, nothing really came out. And everybody was sort of hungry for a movie. And the stars just really aligned for it. Now, going into a few weeks ago, um, tracking usually starts about three weeks before a movie comes out. And it's just basically to give the studios an idea of what to expect. Uh, for the box office and to give them some data to work with in the final three weeks to do that home stretch marketing, right? To sort of market or deviate the marketing plan to sort of get as much out of that initial uh, opening weekend as they can get in terms of box office, right? How can we get people into the seats? Um, If it's trending pretty low at that three week mark, they'll try and switch things up. If things are working really well, maybe they'll just amplify what they've been doing before. And when tracking came in for it, um, I believe it was in the 60s to 70s opening weekend um, was sort of what the tracking numbers were saying it was going to do this last weekend, which if I saw those as Warner Brothers, I would be wow, this, we have a huge hit in our hands. This is unbelievable. Uh, It's going to break the September record. September record, I think is like uh, like 50 something. I got to look it up. Uh, It's in the 50s. Um, It's going to break the September record. Uh, It's going to be one of the biggest rated R horror openings ever. We're happy. We're happy with the 65. We're happy with the 70. Now, I knew that that tracking was off and low just because doing this for a long time, been following the box office for a long time. Part of doing that is reading uh, 
what people are saying and reading the culture at large and thinking, does that really make sense? And it didn't make sense because it was it had more hype than a 60, 70 million dollar opening. Now, if it had opened at 60 or 70, yeah, would I have been disappointed? Yeah, a little bit, but it would have still been a massive, huge win for the movie and also for the horror genre in general. It just would have been a real big milestone. Horror in general, and I'm going to do a super deep dive into it, and I'll get to the top 10 later, but I got to talk about it for a long time just because it's such a cool ass story. Um, the horror genre in general, you know, has always been around the box office. It's always been a really profitable way for studios to make money, right? Horror movies in general tend to have a lot lower production budgets than a normal blockbuster film or normal drama in some cases or comedy. Uh, They tend to be made for very little money and they tend to do very well at the box office. But um, especially in the last 20 years, horror movies have never really broken that tentpole blockbuster barrier. It just hasn't happened. When you're looking at successful horror films, um, I've got to go to my little spreadsheet here that I have. Um, let's just look over the last couple of years. We'll look at this year. Um, and this will kind of give you an idea of how outrageous this year has been and how amazing its actual actual opening weekend numbers are. I mean, they're just mind boggling and they almost don't make any sense. And just watching the box office people as they were following this weekend react to it, it was just, I think people were in awe. They just did not understand how it was doing this well. Um, If you look at it, you know, it's something this year, two breakout movies in the horror genre this year were Get Out, which came out in February, uh, had maybe the best legs of any movie I've ever followed, almost 6X, I think, from its opening weekend, um, ended up doing $175 million dollars just doesn't make any sense amazing uh and then even before that split which opened in the usually the worst month of the year um came in at 138 uh for its total run and that that was really surprising get out was even more surprising and i think it is like 10x more surprising than any of those movies but in general before this year I would say the the sort of successful mark of a horror film was the hundred million dollar mark. If a horror film got to a hundred million dollars, it was a big, big win, right? A big win. Um, the last one that had a hundred million dollars was the Conjuring sequel, which came out last summer. Um, I quality wise, I'm a horror buff, so that's why I'm gonna I'm like sort of really excited to talk about this. I'm gonna be pretty obsessive. I'm gonna probably rant on for a long time about uh it and how well it's done but it's like it's what i love so i have to talk about it Uh, i didn't like the country too that much i thought it was pretty boring compared to the original but it was pretty successful opened in the summer ended up at 102 million dollars um the last movie before that horror film to make 100 million dollars by the way i'm using data from the numbers uh the numbers.com i think it is is it that's a really, oh, it's the the dash numbers.com. Uh, it's a pretty good box office number site to follow, data site. Um, I tend to use box office mo- mojo a lot more just because I like the layout more and the UI. Neither of them are amazing, but they get the job done. Uh, the reason I'm using the numbers is the numbers has a decent way of tagging genres. And for whatever reason, Box Office Mojo thought it would be a good idea to break out genres more. So I can't really figure out horror movies at large, what they're what they have done all together. I can figure out like little sub genres on Box Office Mojo, but the numbers tags them as horror, all of them as horror. So it's a lot easier to pull out the holistic picture of what's been happening with horror films over the last 30, 40 years. Um, box office mojo just makes it too difficult they really need to fix that um so if there's anything wrong with my data i blame the numbers because it's directly from them uh in any event sort of the successful line for horror films for the i think for the last ah man i don't even know i feel like the last probably since scream um have has been that hundred million dollar mark uh, the Conjuring did 146. Paramor- para- ah, Paranormal Activity 3 did 113. 
uh, Paranormal Activity 1 in 2009 did 124. Uh, if you remove this year, this crazy year in horror that we've had, um, since uh, the start of this decade, 2010, there's only been three horror films that have done $100 million. So it's kind of a big milestone. And then the decade before that, there we had, we had a lot more. Uh, the 2000s was a really big horror decade, um, but nothing was crazy large. Now, there's movies like I Am Legends and Sixth Sense um, that are, you could argue, definitely horror films. Um, but I Am Legend was PG-13. It kind of mixed. It didn't was certainly not a hard horror film at all, like a Saw movie or even a Conjuring movie. Uh, it was very tame and very sort of plastic, um, super super mass appeal. A lot of the ragged uh, sort of um, jagged aspects of a horror film were all sort of rounded off. I don't really consider it a horror film. Uh, but some people might. It seemed more almost like a sci-fi dystopia movie, um, even though it wasn't really sci-fi. But you know what I mean. It just did not feel like it was part of the horror genre. But that was probably, um, the if you want to call it a horror film, one of the most successful horror films of all time did $319 million adjusted. And it's a huge outlier when you're looking at the genre. So that's kind of why I push it away as sort of like, eh, it was PG-13. It certainly didn't really have a lot of gore and it wasn't really didn't have the vibe of a horror film, but that that was a very successfully sort of horror themed film um, in the last, what, 20 years, the most successful one. Um, But it's that hundred million dollar mark. If you go through all the films over the last couple of years or sorry, last couple of decades. Uh, there's almost zero $200 million movies. You got like Blair Witch Project, which I absolutely is a horror film, did 239 back in 1999, and that's essentially it. Uh, Hannibal, uh, serial killer, yeah, I guess I'll give it. It was more of a thriller, psychological thriller, than a horror film, but that did 252. Uh, and then you have I Am Legend, and that's it. Since 2000, there hasn't been another... Uh, or 1999 to be specific, there has not been another horror film that has broken that $200 million barrier. Um, the successful ones have been in the 100, and if they're very good, they break the 150 range. That would be like uh, The Ring did 192 back in 2002. Uh, so the whole point of this is that um, Anything over $100 million is gravy in the horror genre. And this year we had Split do 138. That was huge. Get Out did 175. Massive, massive, huge breakout, considering especially that his production budget was only $5 million, which is just, uh, when you think about it, you know, they spent $250 million on an Avengers movie, $5 million bucks and Get Out and does 175. It's just, it's, it's one of my favorite stories of the year. Um, and I, it was definitely in the year in review. I was going to point out Get Out this year. I'm going to, but now it's going to be kind of, I think, overshadowed by it. And before I go too far down the rabbit hole, let's just talk about what it did. It did $123 million this weekend. That's right, $123 million in a single weekend. In September, which is one of the quietest months of the year, a rated R horror film. It doesn't make any sense. You know, tracking was saying 65. Uh, that was three weeks ago. That felt very, that felt pretty conservative. I think going into the weekends, people were thinking, all right, we we know it's probably going to hit like 70. I was saying it was going to break out, quote unquote, and do like 90. And I thought that would have been just absolutely outrageous. The fact that it did 123 surprised everybody. I did not see a single person on any of the box office nerd nerd forums or anything like that even suggest over 100. And people who, I think one or two people did, and they basically got drowned. You're crazy. You're nuts. That, that That's not even possible, people said. But somehow it did $123 million in a single weekend. And it's broken all of these records. It doubled the September record. Doubled it. Um, I think it had the highest day ever for a rated R film. I think it beat out Deadpool for that, actually. Um, It is just an 
an outrageous, amazing, unbelievable, and I think more, most importantly, and what I'm mostly going to talk about, it's a historic number uh, for the horror genre. Um, you know, normally it made what you would need to make in order to become considered a breakout successful horror film, right? And it made that in a single weekend. You know, if I'm looking at something like last year, The Conjuring 2, uh, that was a really big horror film. Like, The Conjuring was great, did 146. The Conjuring is considered almost like already a classic right now. And it came out four years ago, but it felt like an instant classic. I think you've asked anybody in the horror horror genre who's not too like snooty about it. They're like, oh, it was amazing. And I think everybody considers it just a, a wonderful, great uh, genre flick. It's definitely a genre flick. It's not like high art or anything like that. Um, it It's considered instant classic at 146 in the horror genre. That sequel did 102, also highly successful. You know, it has already passed The Conjuring 2 in three days. So there is something incredibly special about what it has done. And if you sort of look back over the horror genre, you know, it's not like other genres of film. Despite the fact that it's always been around, um, you know, people consider the, the creation of the modern horror film uh, to be like George Romero's Night of the Living Dead in 1968. And I would probably agree with that. I mean, that was like the true horror sort of aesthetic, um, you know, filmed, basically cobbled together. Romero found funding on his own, totally independent, um, got his friends in Pittsburgh and his family to play zombies. I mean, it was like this mixture of indie and like, the horror aspect of it was so outrageous and so grotesque that no studio back then ever would have touched it, right? And so that was sort of, to me, the real foundation of the horror movement. Um, sort of a definitely kind of outsider um, and not, definitely not afraid to, to experiment um, and sort of push the social norms. I mean, that's sort of what the genre has always been about. It's about people facing their fears, or as Wes Craven used to say, about releasing their fears. You know, Craven always used to say, people don't go to horror movies to be scared. They go to horror movies to sort of get rid of their fear, right? The fear they have inside, it's like a, a catharsis for them. Um, and they sort of enjoy being scared because it lets go of what's inside of them. Some deep, deep, dark fear that they have. Um, not to get too artistic. I mean, I really love the genre, obviously. Um, but one thing George Romero, who's probably, you know, might be considered the father of the modern American horror film. And one thing that Wes Craven both said in their careers, and this is throughout their entire careers, you know, 30, 40 years is that the horror film genre has always been sort of a gutter, always been sort of, they used to say ghetto, that's probably not the appropriate term now that people would use. But the idea was that in the horror film genre, you can kind of do whatever you want, right? No one's really gonna care. You're never gonna get paid a lot of money. You're never, never gonna get funded for a large film. You know, even George Romero, after the amazing success of Night of the Living Dead, he had to cobble together money for Dawn of the Dead. And you, when you listen to the way that they found distribution for that film, it sounded like a tech startup. Like they started it in the garage and just sort of had to like, you know, through elbow grease and just sheer determination and a complete lack of shame. They just found a way to make that movie and get it released. And that was after he made one of the greatest horror films of all time. It was 10 years later. Uh, so horror has always sort of been uh, in the shadows of the business. You know, it's always something studios will go to to make some cash. But it's never something that they're going to say, oh, here's a hundred million dollar budget, George Romero or Wes Craven. Oh, man, you're amazing. You've, you know, Wes Craven did Last House on the Left. Um, the Hills Have Eyes in the 70s, two foundational horror films. He basically, it's, I don't even know, created sort of that naturalistic horror back then. 
unbelievable films, almost unwatchable today. That's what blows my mind about if you think about, let's say, 1968, Night of the Living Dead is maybe the start of modern horror, and you go into the 70s. Well, the 70s is filled with these very naturalistic, um, almost primal sort of horror films. Uh, definitely the Wes Craven stuff, but also like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, which made $122 million at the box office in 1974, adjusted, um, which was put out by New Line, which is the same company that put out It, uh, which just made a hundred, which just made that amount of money in a single weekend. Um, so you're seeing how, when, when, you, when you think about that, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, everybody knows that movie. It was a cultural touch point. Um, for horror, um, it was very financially successful. Um, it did 122 million dollars, and I'm trying to contextualize what it means in terms of that, right? So the 70s was about naturalism, about experimental, um, sort of. It's, it wasn't even experimental in terms of storytelling necessarily. It was almost experimental on how much can we push people, how deep can we go into people's psychology and freak them out and make them uncomfortable. And that's like what Wes Craven did with Last House on the Left. One of the most uncomfortable films I've ever seen in my entire life. And I think if audiences saw that today in a movie theater, they would like lose their minds or something. I mean, I don't even know how people would react to it. I think they'd like attack them, the theater manager or something like that. Uh, And the point I'm not trying to make here is that in the 1970s, horror was essentially the ghetto of filmmaking, right? And what I mean by that is like not a lot of money was thrown at it. Um, You could do whatever you want. And there are some amazing horror films that to this day, I think are the gold standard of the genre. I think all the stuff Wes Craven did, um, even stuff like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, obviously I've mentioned, but even like some really crazy films like um, I Spit on Your Grave, which is just, I don't even know how that got released. But most, for the most part, those movies were independently funded and independently made. And maybe they found like a major distributor to put it out after they had already made it. Kind of like the sort of auteur model that we saw in the 90s and, and to this day in independent filmmaking. That was like a real sort of prototype of that. Um, but in the 70s, you know, there were some big horror films, obviously, like I guess you consider Jaws a horror film. Um, if you do, it's like the biggest horror film of all time, did essentially a billion dollars adjusted. Uh, truly a huge, massive blockbuster. Um, but that was 1975. You had stuff like The Omen, Carrie. Um, Omen did 197, Carrie did 105. These are all adjusted. Um, the big moment in horror in the 70s was Halloween. Uh, which did 173, um, but more importantly, also, I believe, independently produced and created, um, but more importantly, started that slasher genre that we're all familiar with from the late 70s, but mostly the 80s, like Friday the 13th, uh, which did $127 million back in 1980. Um, and so the genre's always been very strong, but always in the shadows, always playing you know, it was never a top one or two genre of film. It just, it never had that power. Um, throughout the 80s, you, you know, you had stuff like The Shining, uh, which did 141. Poltergeist did 219. Um, that two, it's almost like the $200 million mark is like the top, top tier. If you can make $200 as a horror film, you'll be remembered for decades. Um, Except unless your Jaws two, which did three hundred eighty million dollars, which nobody remembers. That's I I re, Jaws is one of my favorite films. I can't even watch Jaws two. I think it's terrible. Um, even Jaws three D 3D in nineteen eighty three did one sixteen. Um, you know what I'm not seeing on here is Nightmare on Elm Street. I wonder if the numbers forgot to tag it as horror or something because I I think it must have done a lot more they do have nightmare on elm street 4 in 1988 did 103 million dollars um but in the 80s yeah, yeah like pet cemetery um but again you know it was kind of like the 100 million dollar mark was success if you could somehow leg it past 150 that'd be great 
anything over 200, 200 was like a foundational film, like Alien made over $200 million. Um, adjusted, of course. Um, and it was sort of that way in the 90s was just this. There was nothing. The 80s really played up that slasher motif. They put out a lot of movies that didn't cost that much. They made a lot. They made a lot of money, but not the 200, 300 million dollar mark. Right. They weren't even close to that, essentially. Uh, they overdid it. And then in the 90s, it was just ugh. you had Bram Stoker's Dracula did 172 uh, interview with the vampire to 222. Very successful. Um, but besides that, it was very, very quiet until Scream comes out. Um, so in the 70s, you had this very naturalistic, super indie type of horror that was being made, which is probably my favorite era of horror movies with the Wes Cravens and the Texas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, Eve Dawn of the Dead came out in 1978. Stuff like that was just my favorite type of genre, era of horror film. 80s, you have more of the slasher um kind of like poltergeist ghost stuff um you also had pet cemetery in the 80s as well 124 million dollars another stephen king adaptation uh, along with the shining of course um and then everything sort of leads up to scream i think that's when it's a huge reset button so scream comes out december 1996 rated r does about 200 million dollars revitalizes the whole genre after a very um, quiet early part of the 90s um, and then you have all the the slasher sort of um, uh, sort of I don't know they're, they're not that they're bad films it's just they're so clearly copycats off the success of Scream in the 90s you had I Know What You Did Last Summer which did 136 Scream 2 which is great does 190 um, doing even better or a little bit less than the original uh, then you have like uh, Halloween H2O. I remember seeing that opening weekend. I've seen most of these. Me- Anything past about 1997, I've seen an opening weekend if it's a horror film for the most part. Um, even by 1998, it just seems super hacky with H2O. That does 100 million bucks. Um, but then there's another reset in 1999. Uh, Blair Witch Project starts the found footage movement. Uh, which had been which has been going ever since and kind of ended with the par- paranormal activity series exploding or imploding whatever you want to call it and just being awful by the end um and so you have this revitalization of horror in the late 90s and um another sort of genre pops up with Blair Witch Project in 1999 but again still there's just not any huge 300 million dollar horror film um, the only one in this era that you could, you might tie into it is, is I am legend. And I don't, I don't really consider that a horror film. Um, that was just sort of like a dystopia kind of sci-fi Will Smith, like PG 13, uh, action movie. It was more of an action movie than a horror film. Right. And so it doing $123 million in its opening weekend is historic because it changes the genre. This has never really happened before in the genre. There has never been a performance like this in the genre in any recent decade. Like there's nothing that ever really comes close to be honest with you. Um, especially the fact that it is very much a horror film. It's not like half action movie or anything like that. It is a horror film. It was rated R or is rated R and it did $123 million this weekend. Now, to put that into context, right, like, you know, what did Spider-Man do this year? You know, it's a comic book movie, MCU, the sixth movie. I mean, just massive, massive, massive. Did 117 its opening weekend. It beats it. Wonder Woman does $103 million opening weekend. Massive, huge, way beyond expectations. Ends up doing well over $400 million. That's a different story. But it beats it opening weekend. So you have this $35 million production budget for it you have this 35 million dollar movie blowing apart these massive huge 150 170 million dollar production movies it's just it's insane and it's awesome to see and it makes it takes horror out of that gutter that it's always been in and it's been in since the 1970s and the 1960s 
and now it has blasted it out of that ghetto and that gutter that Wes Craven and George Romero talked about and that sort of stigma that hurt both of their careers Romero and Wes Craven like tried to get out of the horror genre some uh, especially Wes Craven and they were never able to do it really um because it was just this oh you make horror films like that's just that's over here um, in the dark, we know that we get money from these films, but they're not huge blockbusters. We'll give you $10 million to make a movie and we expect $50 million back. We love that. And that's what studios have been doing for the last 40, 50 years. But it changes that. It changes it in so many different ways. Um, I, you know, I, I think that, um, moving forward, horror films are going to get bigger, bigger budgets, Right it proves that you can open a horror film to over a hundred million bucks, um, which has never been done before. Just never been done. Never even considered it before. Um, it now has more money than one of the more, most of the successful horror films of the last 10 years and it's single weekend. Um, so it's going to change that perception among studios without a doubt. Um, it's going to change September right even just sort of get off the horror track for a bit it's going to change september like this is the biggest opening september times two right it doubled the last one at least doubled um so now september is fair game for blockbusters and it never hasn't been for ever um now i think labor day is fair game now because this could have easily opened last weekend and probably done just as well, if not better. But the hurricane wasn't there. You got to think that Florida was like what they said about 6% of the box office usually. And Florida was essentially shut down this weekend. And this movie still does 123. Um, so now September is fair game for blockbusters. And it's just, you don't often see a movie change the business this much in like a three day period. But I think it has really done it. Um, and it may end up being the biggest story of the year at the box office. It'll probably compete with Wonder Woman a bit and maybe get out. Um, but on top of that, um, horror is no longer this sort of s- side genre, in, you know, in the gutter that just young teenagers like. And that's about it. And if it makes 30, 40 million bucks, That's all it needs to make because it costs $2 million to make. That's no longer the case. It's no longer just for for horror nerds like myself. You used to hang out at like Blockbuster and Hollywood Video and like check out all the foreign horror films. It's no longer a genre for nerds. (laughs) Although nerds kind of became cool in the last decade, let's be honest. And maybe that's why it is doing so well on some level. Um, Now horror is going to compete with the big genres of film like maybe not comic book movies comic book movies are in their own world but the action movies the big historical dramas horror is now sort of in that echelon or can be this is all going to depend on what the, how the studios react to it and, it and it's amazing the 123 million dollar performance this weekend it could go two ways, honestly. I'm, I'm sort of talking it up, sort of being a little bit, a little bit hyperbolic. I'm very hyperbolic. Um, but it could go two ways. The business could see its performance and say, hey, like it was kind of a one off, um, you know, Stephen King book. You had the TV miniseries, which is sort of a, a historical touch point for a lot of people under, f- probably under 40. Uh, we all remember it. We're, we were all terrified of it as kids. The scene where Pennywise is in the sewer, like terrified everybody I knew growing up. Uh, so the studios might think it's a kind of a one off situation that like, OK, the sequel will come out, probably open it at 100 million, 120 million. And, you know, they'll make their money off this series. And that's sort of it. I could see that happening, unfortunately. Um but I don't believe it's going to happen. I believe the industry will respond to this movie and say, hey, we've always treated horror films as sort of like this um, kind of this little genre um, where we didn't really have to pay attention to it. We didn't ha- really have to watch it. It was just a reliable moneymaker. 
uh, and a great return on investment, but it was never going to make us $300 million at the box office. Um, it, we would just be happy with 30 or $40 million for, for a horror film. Um, but now it has, has really catapulted the genre to new heights. Uh, and I'm really excited to see where it goes. And where, where what is it we're going to end up at? I mean, that's the big question, right? Um, it's per theater average was $30,000, which uh, this is where I really got it wrong. I was like, I was, the per theater average, I was guessing was about twenty one, twenty two thousand dollars $22,000. That clearly was not even close. Um, it did have a massive opening at over 4,100 uh, screens, so that certainly helped get it up into the 120s. Um, but hey, you know, Florida was essentially underwater and without power most of the weekend. So um, any sort of advantage you could give the film, uh, nothing's going to really outweigh that disadvantage of, of losing one of the most populous states. Um, where's it going to go? So it's at 123. Uh, it's a hype film. Uh, it feels like almost like Beauty and the Beast or Jurassic World, where it's a must see for everybody out there. And people are gonna, are gonna drag their friends along. Um, it really does feel like uh, an event film for a lot of people. Uh, so 123, let's assume, horror films tend to have a little bit lower multipliers just because everybody goes to rush out and see it opening weekend. And then there's not really a lot of repeat or follow up business. Um, but I think this one's going to be different because it does feel like an event film. Let's just assume a kind of average 2.7 multiplier. You're looking at $332 million, right? So that would be basically the biggest horror film that lasts 30, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, well, not 40, probably the 30 years, right? Um, I mean, you, it's it's hard to because you can go back to like interview with the uh, vampire, stuff like that, where those films are bigger and I've talked about I am legend. Um, but as a pure horror film, it's probably going to be one of the biggest ones. Well, I know it's going to be one of the biggest ones of all time. Um, it could even go back to like the seventies or something like that as terms of just, uh, outright performance. Uh, so three thirty two. if it somehow legs it out and it does have that event feel to it and people just keep on wanting to see it, uh, you're looking at $370 million. So it's going to break the $300 million mark. I almost have no doubt that that's going to happen. Uh, that in and of itself is the milestone. It's an historic milestone um, for Stephen King films. It's an historic milestone uh, for rated R films. It's an historic milestone for Warner Brothers. Uh, and most importantly, it's an historic milestone for the horror genre. Uh, because I think... The days, especially when you link it up with Get Out and Split's performance this year. Um, and it's kind of interesting. There's two renaissances going on in horror right now. And as a horror fan, it's probably the most exciting time for horror easily since I've been alive, uh, which is about 35 years now. Uh, you have this sort of mainstream horror renaissance happening with Split, Get Out, and It. It obviously being the king, but um, if, if it hadn't happened this year, Split and Get Out would be two massive stories, but it's going to overshadow it, I think, a bit. Um, so you have this mainstream horror renaissance going where everybody's going to see these movies and they're breaking the $100 million mark so easily. Uh, you also have underneath the surface, you have this more indie throwback to the 1970s um, sort of more experimental, more raw, more primal horror films, more naturalistic horror films, uh, which started before this mainstream renaissance, and that would be It Follows, um, The Witch, even something like Raw out of France, uh, and this year something like It Follows, or not It Follows, uh, It Comes at Night. Um, so you have these two sort of parallel tracks and Get Out's kind of a crossover between the two because it definitely had the indie, smaller experimental vibe, but it crossed over and did so well to be a mainstream success, which you can't really say if it follows or the witch. Um, so I guess the end of the story with it is that like the horror genre was going through an amazing resurgence over the last three or four years, and it just sort of was the massive cherry on top. Um, or even it's it's even bigger than that because it does 
break through the barrier that the genre has always been put in uh, since the 1960s. Um, so we'll see. We'll see where it ends up. There's already a sequel in the works. It'll come out in 2019. Um, I wonder what they're going to budget that at. My guess would probably be in the 80s or 90s for that movie. Uh, they'll probably at least double the budget that they had for it. Um, but it's just you know, another record that it broke, and I think is important to mention, is that it's the I had the lowest production budget of a movie to break $100 million opening weekend. Um, and that's tip, that's that's the horror thing, right? It's just low budgets with amazing return on investment, and, and I think horror is going to be the biggest example of that over the last few decades, actually. Um, so it was massive, 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 and I could probably talk about it um, and I will talk about it for the next few weeks. Um, but I really wanted to, to, to sort of do a deep dive on that film and, and kind of give people some context as to how important it was and is. Uh, I think when you see that number and you're kind of a lay person and maybe you follow the box office every once in a while um, and you haven't been doing it for a long time, 123 sounds really big. It's like, oh, that's great. But like, oh, there's like Deadpool. That was a big example. American Sniper was another big surprise. And then you try and compare it to like, you know, Avengers or, you know, look at the final tally of Wonder Woman or any of the comic book movies. And you might say like, oh, it's like really good, but it's not like the biggest ever. Right. So why are people so excited about it? And I kind of wanted to walk through that and kind of give people um, just context as to why it is historical. It's not just a surprise. It's not just, oh, wow, that's really good. It's an historical moment at the box office that I think is cool and um, awesome to sort of experience and analyze. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep talking about it in the next few weeks. Um, but I really wanted to sort of give people my take on why I thought it was so important um, that had, it had done so well. And I, the fact that it was New Line, you know, the company that put out Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, and I believe they also put out um, Nightmare on Elm Street, I think. I almost, I'm almost positive about that to look that up. Uh, just sort of, it feels, it feels really good. You know, it feels really good that this this studio now it's an imprint of Warner Brothers and it's not really that separate, um, but it feels kind of almost poetic that um, that film, uh, that studio uh, put out the this sort of um, historical, sort of amazing. Uh, oh, they also put out the uh, the release Night of Living Dead. Now I'm going through like New Line's entire fucking filmography. I don't want to do that and bore you guys. Um, did it put out? Yes. So New Line put out um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and they put out Nightmare on Elm Street. And I remember Wes Craven talking about this when they made that film. And that was a really rough go of trying to find a distributor. Nobody wanted to touch the movie, but New Line did. And it's just it's just amazing to see them now. They also put out The Evil Dead. Unbelievable. Unbelievable studio. Um but enough about it. I'll, I'm going to talk about it for like the next year or so. I don't want to bore everybody too much with talking about it. Um, but I think it is really important to establish uh, how important this opening really was at $123 million uh, on its opening weekend. All right. So let's talk about the rest of the top 10. Um, it was kind of boring, but there's a couple bigger stories to talk about. Uh, number two this weekend was Home Again, uh, Open Road Films. This is the rom-com with Reese Witherspoon. Uh, she plays like a 40, 40-something mother um, who uh, ends up like dating multiple younger men or something. I can't, the, the trailer was like played constantly. It, it seemed... I don't know, kind of, I'm a big, actually, I'm a huge horror fan, but I also really like rom-coms, uh, ironically. Um, it seemed kind of good from the trailers. I was like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I might watch that. Um, it, it, it had a lot going against it this weekend, let's be honest. You had it having a historic opening. Um, it's an open road films, which may not exist in like six months. Uh, they're sold to a Chinese company and they might just liquidate it and just release all the films that are already done. Uh, so the, you know, the, the marketing, I, I could make the excuse to say the marketing wasn't pervasive, but I, I, 
I saw, every time I went to the movies, I saw like a trailer for it, and it's been all over the place. So I don't know. I don't think they really pulled their punches on the marketing. Uh, Old one on twenty nine, uh, almost three thousand screens did eight point six million uh, for the weekend. Per theater average sub three thousand. Um, budget was fifteen million. You know, compare that to it over there. Um, what's there to say about this? I mean, Reese, Wither- Reese Witherspoon, I think, has her career on lockdown. She knows what she's doing. She's super smart. Um, she has some, you know, Wild was amazing. Um, her movie stuff has just not been great recently. Uh, the last thing she was in was Hot Pursuit, the last bigger film, uh, which I I didn't really follow when this came out, but it was actually a massive, a pretty big flop. Came out in May 2015. Um, I guess I just remember her from Wild and Little Big Lies on HBO, so I thought her career was doing fantastic. Um, but film wise, you know, outside of Wild, she was in an Inherent Vice, I think, in a small part. But she hasn't really had a huge breakout film um, in, in, a, in a long while. Um, you know, I think the last one probably she walked the line, made about 120 million bucks uh, for Christmases. She was in did 120 as well. Um, you know, I guess her like maybe her um, sort of. Uh, celebrity kind of outweighs her box office performance because she really hasn't had a lot of hundred million dollar films recently. Um, and so, you know, with this film, it just didn't make any sense. I think in terms of a business proposition, rom-coms are kind of dead. I know big sick people think that they, it's coming back. I don't know. This seemed like a very traditional 1990s, 1980s rom-com and it clearly did not connect with audiences. And maybe you can make the argument that it sucked the air out of the, the box office. But, I mean, it, 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 it's great counter-programming, right? For people who don't want to see a killer clown, I think a, a rom-com, Reese Witherspoon, rom-com is a pretty good alternative, right? Um, but that number is just not going to cut it. And if, if there's anybody to blame, it's probably Open Road Films who just didn't market it appropriately. Um but, I, you know, like I said, I did see a lot of marketing for it. So maybe it just wasn't the right product at the right time. Uh, in any event, it is a failure. Um, it's not a total flop. I mean, $8.5 million is not terrible. If it was like $3 million, I'd be like, oh, my God. Um, I think it's going to have great legs. Um, although the critics kind of savaged it a bit, 35% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, audience score was a lot higher at 60%, which I could totally see. Rom-coms are kind of like comedies and horror films where critics are really hard. Audiences aren't because they're going expecting sort of um, kind of a cookie cutter movie on some level. Um, uh, cinema score is a B for Home Again. Uh, so I think the legs will be pretty decent. Um, if they do uh, maybe like a 2.7, uh, it's 2.6, it'll break the $20 million mark. So it's not like a total loss or like a, a huge, huge flop because the production budget was so small. Uh, it just didn't break out. I thought it was going to break out. Like when I first saw the trailer, I was like, huh, uh, it looked it looked good to me. Um, but for whatever reason, it just did not connect um, and I think a lot of it has to do with if you just remove the it phenomenon this weekend, um, I think a lot of it has to do. I don't think it's Reese Witherspoon. I think it's just the rom com general genre. The rom com genre just doesn't click with people anymore. Um, and I don't know why that is. I have no idea why that is. Why rom coms died? Um, I think it's maybe like a millennial thing. Like younger people just don't connect with those stories anymore i know i don't like i look back well i look back at old rom-coms like even like speaking of uh reese witherspoon like sweet home alabama and it's just like eh, it just seems a little too hammy for stuff nowadays everything has to be so realistic and like authentic these days and i think rom-coms have this inherent uh artificiality to them um in any event home again kind of i would say like half flopped um, not a total flop, but did not break out at all. 
Um, and it might stick around for about 20 million bucks. Uh, number f- three was the Hitman's Bodyguard, uh, 4.8 million, uh, 55% drop, which is not great. Um, per theater average is about 1,500 bucks. Uh, has somehow made a way, made its way to 65 million bucks this uh, over the last four weeks. Um, mostly because August was a barren desert. Um, I kind of took advantage of that. Number four was Annabelle Creation, uh, four million uh, for the weekend, forty-seven percent drop. Um, uh, you know, obviously, it took a huge, huge chunk out of that audience. Uh, also, a New Line film, by the way. I mean, New Line and under the Warner Brothers um, sort of parent label has just been it's been crushing it. Um, total take so far, it is going to break that hundred million dollar mark. Uh, which until it came out was sort of the previous horror movie um, sort of home run mark or, you know, super success mark, super success mark. What a stupid phrase. Um, the hundred hundred million dollar mark was like a big deal. And like last week is like, oh, it's going to make a hundred million bucks. That's awesome. But now it's sort of like, well, it came out like it's just all different now. It changed the whole ball game. Uh, Wind River uh, was number five this last weekend. Uh, Three point one million. Uh, 50% drop, higher than I would have thought for that one. Um, it added about 290 screens. Per theater average is getting pretty low, just about um, $1,080 per theater. Uh, has done great, though. I mean, I really questioned the release of this a lot in the podcast, and I was just totally wrong. Um, August was just so barren. Uh, that Wind River j- just legged it out, really legged it out um, over the month, and it's still kind of sticking around a bit, uh, just about $25 million total so far. Um, Leap uh, did $2.4 million, 50% drop, um, big, f- uh, decent flop, I would say, $15, uh, $16 million so far. Uh, number seven, Spider-Man Homecoming, uh, $2 million, uh, about a 46% drop, lost a about 380 screens per theater average is not bad for its 10th weekend uh 1200 per theater uh a pretty amazing 327 million dollars so far for spider-man again like wind river annabelle and hitman's bodyguard really took advantage uh in the last few weeks uh, of a super quiet august um number eight was dunkirk 1.8 million uh, a 58 percent drop Um, lost 642 theaters so that kind of makes sense Um, per theater average was $882 to be exact Um, total tech so far was 183 million bucks the more I think about that Dunkirk after seeing it and looking at that number um, kind of a a bigger story than I previously thought Uh, I think Nolan it may go down as one of Nolan's best films in his career Uh, obviously has a long career to go still but just the way he played with time in that movie and narrative, I think it'll be studied in film schools for a long time. And that, you know, $183 million performance is, is only going to help that uh, sort of prestige of the film. Um, number nine was Logan Lucky, uh, 1.7 million, uh, 62% drop, um, only $770 per theater. Total tech was 25 million bucks. Uh, this was sort of Steven Soderbergh's experiment that did not go well. Um, should have done at least double, I would say triple that. Um, that would be my expectation for a movie like that with a $29 million budget and no stars in it and Steven Soderbergh attached. Yeah, I'm going to expect about a $70 million take on that uh, with a breakout being about $100 million bucks, and it just didn't happen. Uh, number 10 was the Emoji Movie, uh, $1.1 million. Uh, 54% drop. Um, I just don't know how this movie made $82 million. Nobody likes it. I don't ever want to talk about it ever again. Um, and that's mostly it. I don't really want to go on anymore because I talked about uh, it for a long time. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what's coming up this next weekend. Obviously, it is going to do, I don't know, probably like at least a f- 50, maybe 60% drop for it, maybe. It depends on how much it, it really becomes an event film. Um, it, it was a four. Qu- how, how was I don't even know how this is possible. How was it a four quad movie? It was. And everybody's been talking about it but a four, as a four quad movie. But it was a rated R horror film. I mean, everybody wanted to see it. It's crazy. Um, 
there's like we're into the really busy season now so there's stuff constantly coming out next week we have two big releases um or i should say this week in a few days uh, american assassin which i thought was really going to break out and do well because it seemed pretty cool like a cool action movie that would connect with like especially middle america uh and like the not urban areas um uh, put out by Lionsgate or 3000 theaters. I think it was a book series or something like that. Uh, trailers are pretty good. I don't know how it's going to do now with it just like sort of being so massive. And I feel really bad for Darren Afnofsky's uh, mother, which comes out next week. It's listed as a drama. This is why box office mojo and genre stuff doesn't make any sense. Mother is not a drama. I can tell you right now it's a horror film. Like it's not a drama. This is why I can't trust their genre stuff, their genre numbers. Uh, so Mother comes out next week, uh, 2,500 screens. From what I hear, it's very, very, very good, um, but it's extraordinarily disturbing. And I'm hearing that there might be a lot of walkouts. We might have the rare, the rare F Cinema score. You heard it here, fro- heard it here first, folks. I can't even talk. I've been talking about it so much. Um, and that's it for next weekend. And then things don't stop. The weekend after, friend requests another horror film. Kingsman, The Golden Circle comes out. Lego Ninja Movie comes out. And it's just, it's nonstop till probably January, to be honest with you. It's probably nonstop until next August, to be honest with you. Um, I don't think we'll ever see a barren period uh, like this August ever again. In any event, uh, thanks for listening, guys. Um, This is kind of a special episode where I wanted to talk a lot about horror films and it. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I will be back next week uh, to talk about the new openers and to see how it did in its second weekend. Uh, thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.